privileged to study God's Word today. We're going to be taking the Lord's Supper together in a moment, so let's jump into our study of the book of Matthew. This passage is not too difficult to understand, and it has such amazing application. There's not one of us who can sit here and say, I have need of nothing. In fact, I would suspect, I would suggest, that is, if you are feeling that way, I have need of nothing, I would suggest you start by asking for humility. We all have needs. We all need to grow. We all need to mature. We all need more virtue to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. We all have physical needs in our lives, relational needs in our lives, and so we can come to God with those needs and ask. Some of it it is indeed physical need, health, money, support. Jesus says ask. Most of us, the need we have is a spiritual need. We need to grow. We need to mature. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to find joy walking with Him. And yet so often is the case, we're not desperate enough to simply ask. Maybe we throw up a prayer here and there but we're not desperate enough to pray and seek God on our faces. So that's what I want to do today. I want to convince you to pray. Prayer is the ultimate act of obedience and belief. It's the ultimate demonstration of humility and genuine faith. So we're looking at Matthew chapter 7, and we are blessed to study verses 7 through 11. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Let me read it to you. You can just follow along. Jesus is speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? I pray that God blesses the reading of His Word. Now, why is this passage where it is? It's kind of a, a strange place to talk about prayer I want you to think like a Bible scholar for a moment, looking at Jesus' sermon. He's been, he's been preaching in this section to his disciples about relationships, how you should treat one another, how you should live with one another. And we saw this last week. Don't judge. Don't have a, a critical spirit. Don't live in judgment of others, constantly criticizing. And, and next time, as we gather and look at the, the next passage right after this, we'll Learn about that very familiar golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So this entire section is on how we live and treat others. This is about relationships. And sort of stuck here awkwardly in the middle is this little passage on prayer. What's going on? What was going on in the mind of Jesus? Why why would he put this here at this moment? Well, I can think of a couple reasons Jesus would have paused his discussion on relationships and talked about prayer for a little bit. First of all, what is more wonderful and what is more painful than relationships? I mean, relationships bring us the greatest joy as well as the greatest need and the greatest pain. Our greatest anxiety is in relationships. I don't know how many times I've been told, Pastor John, I am going through this great difficulty in my relationship, I would rather have cancer. I'd rather have something terminal, some sort of illness. I'd rather be penniless and poor. I'd rather be broke. I'd rather have nothing. I'd rather suffer all kinds of fleshly circumstances, earthly circumstances, but I don't want to suffer this relational problem. It's what keeps you up at night. It's what turns you from side to side, makes you sweat bullets, fills you with anxiety and frustration, and it's the hardest point of human existence relationship. Outside of discerning your own relationship with God, your relationship with others is something that is the most beautiful and yet can be the most painful part of our lives. I 
I've even heard people tell me, Pastor John, I'd prefer death than this relationship. I even know people who have taken their lives because of difficult relational problems. Outside of our need for peace with God, the most important need of our lives is peaceful relationships. And so it serves to reason that in the middle of his discussion on relationships with others, that Jesus would pause and remind us to whom we should go with our relationship problems. We go to God. We ask. We seek. We knock. And God, through his word, through his bride, the local church, answers us and supports us and gives us affirmative sustenance in our relationship so we can suffer these devastating issues. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Now, I have to remind you, maybe God doesn't answer those relational questions, those requests in the way in which we want Him to. Remember this, God doesn't always answer these relational questions in the way that we want Him to. I mean, some people sort of go to God and they say something like this, Lord, I know the plans I have for you. I can give you great street cred, God, if you solve my problems here. I can prosper you, God. I can make this really good if you just reach down and zap that person or fix this relationship, if you just do this. God often instead gives us a desire and the ability to suffer through these difficult things in the right way and to find discipline and to find repentance and to find forgiveness and to find reconciliation. These things are not easy to come by, but God grants these things Over periods of time, if you seek these things, he answers, he provides this. And so I would say to those of you struggling in relationships right now, and that's many of us, many of us in this room, struggle in some way in relationships, cry out to God, ask, seek, knock, plead with God that he would provide you with a way of repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation and your relationships. I think that's the first reason why Jesus puts this section of prayer right in the middle of the issue of relationships. Don't forget, ask God to help you in this. Of all places we need to pray, it's on our relationship with others, and you need to go to God for your relational issues. The second reason why I can think that Jesus puts us here, as I see it, is because he's just discussed discernment. If you remember last week's message, discernment, discerning that log that's in your own eye, discerning your own sin, discerning even how to help others when it's important to help others. You have to discern. You have to ask the question. We talked about this last time. You have to ask the question, am I just being a nag? Am I just being critical? Do I just have a judgmental spirit? Or am I sincerely wanting this person to grow in faith and in their relationship with God? If not, then I'm blind to my own log that's in my own eye. We need discernment. How do you find discernment? Well, you can study truth. You can study the Bible. That would be the primary way you learn discernment, but you can also ask for it. Lord, give me discernment. Give me discernment. Precisely what we heard from James a moment ago. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously. And so you ask, you seek, you knock. Lord, I need discernment, not just in relationships, but just within life, in my own heart, in my own relationship with you and my walk for holiness. Lord, I need discernment. Ask, seek, and knock. And I believe that's why Jesus puts this here, so that we would habitually, regularly, and with sincerity go to him in prayer. All right, I hope that helps us see why Jesus would digress a moment to remind us of prayer. And it's worth noting that this instruction here that he gives is not limited to relational issues or discernment issues. This kind of language Jesus repeats throughout his ministry. It is language, it is theology that is true of all prayer. So it's not just about these issues, though I think he wants to remind us of these things right in the middle of this discussion for important reasons. I believe God, is, God through Jesus, is giving us a universal, universal truth regarding prayer. So let's study what it says. Look at verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. 
And both in our translation, the English translation, as well as in the original, what Matthew wrote in, the Greek language, when he was recording Jesus' sermon, these words, ask, seek, and knock, these are imperatives. These are commands. Jesus gives us our marching orders. You pray for one reason, many reasons, but one of the reasons is out of obedience. It's what you've been told to do. You've been told to go to him for these things. Maybe the whole reason that God created this situation that's going on in your life is so that you would finally start going to him and begging him and pleading with me. I don't know if you've noticed this. When, when you go through hard times, your prayer life suddenly gets really rich, doesn't it? Suddenly, you, you become a prayer warrior, the prayer warrior you were always supposed to be. Perhaps God is providing you difficult situations in your life so that you would finally obey him and go to him in prayer. Well, you need anything, pray. We pray not because you know, we have this ability to twist God's arm and make him do what we want, but because it's the right thing thing to do. It honors Him. It recognizes Him as the source. It worships Him. It's a, it's a matter of His glory. Out of obedience, we pray. So, number one, if you're taking notes, pray as an expression of an obedient faith. Pray as an expression of an obedient faith. If your faith is genuine faith, if it's a faith, like I said, uh, James describes there in James chapter 1, if it's a genuine faith, it will have action and you will pray. Remember chapter 6. Back in chapter 6, Jesus told his disciples before he gave them the model prayer, pray then like this. Again, it's a command. In fact, just, just flip to chapter 6 for a moment. Let's look at this model prayer once again, just to remind ourselves. It's been a few weeks, maybe a couple of months since we've touched on some of these things. Look at verse 9 of chapter 6. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's the starting place? What's the foundation of our prayer? Well, it's the glory of God. It's hallowing his name. So above all, when we go to God in prayer, it's about his glory. It's about his name being hallowed. It's about his kingdom come. And it's not about your will. It's about God's will. Lord, not my will. Your will be done on earth. This is the foundation of prayer. The foundation of prayer, Jesus has already instructed us, is not what, you, what, what I want, it's what God wants. And it's about you surrendering your will to his. That's a starting place of prayer. Next part of the Lord's Prayer, again, this is informing us about what we're praying for. Give us this day our daily bread. We pray for the sustenance to live. Remember this? It's not wrong to pray for physical needs, physical support, physical things like food, shelter, money, health, sustenance. It is wrong to start there as though that is the essence of prayer. You want stuff. You want healing. It's important to start your prayer with your submission to the will of God for the glory of God. That's the beginning of prayer. And we learn this as we studied the model prayer. You start with the glory of God. Then you can begin to ask, Lord, I have daily needs. I need sustenance. I need health. I need help. I come to you trusting that you can sustain me. Pray then we learned for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. You pray for the forgiveness of sins, and then you pray for the ability to forgive others when they sin against you. And then finally, you remember from our study of chapter 6, pray for victory over temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You pray for holiness. You pray for Christ's likeness. You want to reflect Jesus here on earth, and so you ask for it. Of all that to say this, there in chapter 6, Jesus gives us a command pray and he shows us how to pray the manner in which even the words we can use to pray pray it's a command pray for these things and here in chapter 7 he says the same thing here's a command an imperative pray ask seek seek the glory of god seek sustenance seek forgiveness seek holiness in fact, if you, if you go back even earlier into chapter 5, remember chapter 5 starts out with the Beatitudes, and then you have all these, 
these, these moral commands, how we are to live in this world, how we are to live with others. You go to God, Lord, I need help to follow these things, to have these beatitudes. You seek God for these things. You, you ask for these character traits. You, you ask to be filled with the Spirit. You ask to, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. You ask to, to live like Christ. You go to Him seeking and asking. By the way, you don't go to God demanding, claiming, telling God, I claim this. You'll notice these words here. It's very interesting. Jesus says, pray, ask, seek. These are respectful words. Knock. That's a respectful word. So you go to obey Jesus. You go to him. You go to God. You begin to pray. You don't go to him making claims on what you think your life should be or what you think God owes you or what you think God that you deserve. No, though your prayers may humbly request sustenance, even help, that request is tempered with your submission to his will for his glory. We learned all this. Ladies and gentlemen, this perspective that Jesus gives us on prayer totally destroys the prosperity gospel, doesn't it? You lift this verse out, these verses here in chapter 7 about asking and seeking and knocking. You, you rip this out of context and you come up with this idea that you go to God and you claim this and want this and want that. If you put it in context and just ask this very simple question, as I look at the Sermon on the Mount, what would God have me pray for? You're not going to come up with Rolls Royce, mansion, win the lottery. In fact, your prayers will primarily, I mean, really, in all those, those the early parts of the Sermon on the Mount, all the way leading up to here, there's that one little request for daily bread, which does mean physical sustenance. Everything else is a spiritual request. Lord, change me. Lord, make me holy. Lord, help me forgive, and forgive me you, you can never do justice to what it says here, ask, seek, knock. You can never do justice by ripping it out of context and applying it free will to some sort of name it, claim it mentality. Prayer starts with the humble submission to God, to submission and desire for His glory, to, to see Him glorified in your life. Again, you might ask gently, submissively for provisions, for sustenance. No problem with that kind of prayer at all. He teaches us to pray like that, but your objective in prayer is not stuff. It is the glory of God. It is a matter of obedience. I go to you because you are the only one I can go to and trust. You ask, you seek, you knock. Well, now that we've situated in context what we're praying for, we can now see how God would lovingly and willfully always answer our prayers in the affirmative. Once you find out that I need to temper what I pray for and how I pray and how I approach God, you realize, yes, he does indeed answer these prayers. Again, not when I give him a list, but if you're begging each day that you would glorify him, guess what? He'll answer that prayer. If you're begging God for humility, if you're passionate about finding humility and brokenness, God will answer that prayer. If, you're, if your passion is to, is to find forgiveness, forgiveness of your own sin, perhaps your passion is to reconcile with others, God grants these things to us. God wants to give these things to us. That you, we would find purity, that we would find faithfulness, that we would be forgiven God will gladly give us these things and more. Our problem is, if we're all honest with ourselves, none of us pray as we should, do we? I mean, we all fail at this. Maybe you do pray sort of along the, the Lord's Prayer and you think about these things, but your prayer life is not this driving desire to ask, seek, to knock 
to constantly drive at God. In fact, that word seek gives you that idea that it's this constant coming to God. Lord, I need, I seek. It's like you're on a journey and I'm, I'm going after this. I, I desire these things. It might be helpful just to get into your mind that praying is an act of obedience. God wants you to come to him. God wants you to honor him in this way. How many times we fail and we sort of toss out these prayers here and there and say these things sort of half-heartedly, pray a little more when we're around church people or maybe want to display something for our kids or something like that, but we hardly pray alone. And then when life gets hard, we show up to the throne room, hat in hand, sort of kicking the dirt, saying, God, you know, I got some problems here. No, we ought to, in obedience, consistently pray. We should pray because this is an expression of, of an obedient faith. All right, number two, pray as an expression of a believing faith. Look at verse nine. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? What's the point here? Pretty easy to come to. Prayer is the act of a believing faith. Lord, I believe you are who you say you are, a loving Father. I come to you on the basis of your character, on the basis of of your faithfulness, on, on the basis of who you are. I can approach your throne because of your character demonstrated in Christ. And so, Lord, I approach you trusting and believing in your character. And Jesus gives us this argument. Certainly, God is a better father than any of us. If you, even the worst of you, know how to give good gifts, surely God, who is far beyond any one of our imaginations about what a father is, God will be infinitely more loving and good and holy and give us what we need. Jesus is saying this, listen carefully, greater belief leads to more prayer, not less. Greater belief leads to more prayer, not less. I don't know about you, but I found myself sidestepping the discipline of prayer with some sort of skewed excuse of God's sovereignty, oh Lord, you'll just take care of it all, I'm just not going to, whatever. Whatever. And I forget that God has told me to ask him. Oh God, you're sovereign. You'll, you'll work out everything. I have faith you will. These are true words. But I have to confess that oftentimes I use that doctrine of God's sovereignty to sidestep this discipline of prayer. God wants us on our knees praying like we should. God wants us going to our closet in prayer, spending hours praying and pleading, articulating every last holy desire that we can, we can think of. Not firing off some short prayer about God's sovereignty and everything working out for good. God wants us in his throne room. I mentioned this earlier, but if you think about these words, prayer is a pleading, this is a continual asking that the imperative here is an active imperative. It's, it's moving, it's action. It, it's not something you did in the past or you do shortly. It's abrupt. No, this is long. This is a pleading with God. Prayer is this journey, this idea of seeking, like you're seeking for a treasure or you're, you're looking for something. Lord, here I am again. I'm on this journey. I'm seeking something. I'm seeking you. I'm seeking ultimately your glory in all this. It's like I'm on a marathon. I, I've started many years ago as a believer, and I continue to plod forward, thinking and praying and coming to you again and again and again. I, here I am again, Lord, praying, seeking your face. And like I said, prayer is an issue of respect. You knock. You don't barge in and claim. You don't demand. You knock. You respectfully ask. The idea here is this continual, respectful, seeking and asking and trusting in God. Why? Why do we go to him like this? Because he can be trusted. His character 
can be trusted. It is a matter of belief and what you believe about him. Let me tell you something. You may claim till you're blue in the face of how much you believe and how much faith you have in God. But if you're not praying, you don't. You don't believe God. You don't believe in his character. You don't live your life based in who he is. You don't live your life anchored in this idea of his glory in your life, your Christ-likeness, if you're not praying. If you truly believe that he can be trusted, you spend hours of your day pleading with God, a continual asking, respectfully seeking him, Well, I want to note to you a couple of things here about the character of God, and then we'll wrap things up. First, it is to remember that God is our Father. Here we are again, right? Right back to the beginning of the model prayer. This this image, this picture of God as our Father. Now, I know none of us have the perfect dad, some less perfect than others. Some dad's downright evil, I understand that. I think all of us, no matter how perhaps evil or terrible our dad was, we have an image in our minds, this very basic image of a good and kindly and wonderful father. And so no matter what kind of daddy problems you might have, there is this idea that there is a perfect father. And you go to him. And his goodness exceeds our imagination. His desires for us exceed our, everything that we could possibly imagine. And we ought to go to this good father, this father who desires to bless us. Second, I want us to remember that language, this language of fatherhood, the fatherhood of God, indicates our adoption as his children. Jesus was not speaking. You remember, he is not speaking to the crowds in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not on the hillside with thousands of unbelievers or a whole bunch of Pharisees and and false people, false followers of God there. He was speaking to those who had abandoned the city and gone up this mountain with Jesus. And he sits down. Remember at the very beginning of chapter 5, he sits down and begins to speak to his, what, disciples. These are people who had abandoned things, perhaps even like Matthew would, and left everything. Or Peter and James and John who dropped their nets and followed after Christ. These are people who were children of God. These are the ones whom John speaks of in chapter 1. These are the ones who have the right to be called the children of God. But John also points out that Just as with human adoption, they were born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. Though we certainly choose God, the reason, the ultimate reason that God is our Father is not our choice of Him, it is His choice of us. We have been adopted and chosen. If you lived in Jesus' day, you might know a little more about Adoption in those days, and to be adopted in those days was something much greater than it is today. You weren't put alongside just all the other kids, the natural-born kids. No, you were actually in an elevated position. You were more secure, more protected, more blessed. Even by the law, you were protected more than even a father's own children. The father had to go to pains. He had to make great payments surrendered his rights in certain ways to obtain you as his child. What a wonderful father. And what a wonderful God, right? He's adopted us as his kids. What a, what a good God. He's gone to great pains. He's surrendered the full expression of his glory and rights. Jesus Christ himself set those things aside so that he would appear as man, becoming a man, and living as a man, a servant, and then dying as a slave. All this God did to adopt you as his child. And how is it that we don't go to him crying, Abba, Father? How is it we don't pray? The lengths to which he went to get us to him, to adopt us. And yet we spend two minutes praying to him. 
Well, this means in terms of God's character, he's not a malicious father. He's not a father who looks at our requests. He's not a trickster. He's not a con artist. He's not, he doesn't do the bait and switch. He gives you what you really need in the time that you need it. Need it. He's not even a, a doting grandfather who just gives you whatever you want because you asked for it. He's a good God, a great father, a father who knows your need and gives them to you when you ask. So all that to say this, your prayer life reveals what you really believe about God. It's an expression of your belief. Well, let me wrap this up by taking us again to that passage we heard earlier. Do you remember it? James 1, 17. James had already said, if anyone lack, lacks, let him ask of God who will give generously. And then, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Verse 18 of James 1, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Someone has said James, who was the brother of Jesus, said less about Jesus but sounds more like Jesus than any other New Testament author, and I believe this is true. That the starting place of our whole relationship with God as far as our experience, obviously there's God's sovereignty that spans the universe and all time, but in terms of our perspective, the starting place of our relationship with God is a prayer. And it's a prayer that we come and we speak to God and He answers. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for mercy. We ask for justification to be right before him. And everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open to him. I can't go without mentioning there's got to be someone in here, and you've never prayed that prayer of salvation. No, it's not special words. There's not some special, you know, sort of uh, mantra that you can say that invokes God's saving you. But when you go to him as a father, Lord, I need forgiveness of sin. Lord, I desire to repent and follow you. Lord, I want to abandon my old way of life and be a Christ follower. To you, Jesus says, whosoever will may come. If you ask, you'll receive. It's a starting place of our salvation. And we as believers of all people should remember that, shouldn't we? That we should go to God asking, seeking, seeking knocking. Let's ask that God would inspire us to do just that. Father, we do confess. We do not pray as we should. We do confess to you that we fail in so many respects in terms of our prayer lives. Of all people who are your children, who understand your character, who have prayed that prayer of salvation and seen you answer it, of all people, Lord, we should be people who are dedicated to your glory through prayer. And yet we confess we fail miserably. So inspire in us today a desire to ask, seek, and knock. Inspire in us a desire to pray and to come to you more habitually, more regularly, and for more hours, longer times. Lord, we understand that you are sovereign and you are mighty and you do what you want and you inspire things and you move things. But God, we also believe that part of the way you activate your will on this earth is through prayer. And so, Lord, many of us in this room, maybe we do not have because we do not ask. I ask, Lord, you would make us as a church a praying church, a church who comes to you regularly, respecting you based upon obedience to your command to pray and based on what we know and what you have proven to us about your character. Give us a desire to pray. Give those who don't know you a desire to pray repentance 
and I beg for mercy and salvation. And Lord, we know you will answer our prayers. We know you will answer this prayer. We know that there are people in this room that will be changed, that will walk away from today praying more than they ever have, perhaps even praying the prayer of salvation. We know you will answer this prayer. These are the prayers of the righteous. These are the righteous prayers you've demonstrated for us in your scripture, in the model prayer. So, Lord, we know that you will answer in the affirmative. Help us pray. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.